Hi, welcome to Listen to Riches. Today, I want to introduce you to an exhilarating book, Investing the Templeton Way. Templeton is recognized as one of the top 10 global fund managers of the 20th century by the New York Times. His investment career spanned an impressive 70 years and he consistently remained in the spotlight of the American investment arena in the latter half of the 20th century. Born in 1912, Templeton was a scholarly young man who excelled academically. He pursued economics at Yale University where he graduated with outstanding achievements, earning him the prestigious Rhodes Scholarship to further his studies in law at the University of Oxford. At the age of 26, Templeton officially entered the field of investment. In 1938, he founded his own securities advisory firm in New York and within a little over a decade, he had become one of the top 10 performers in the entire United States. In 1954, Templeton established his first fund in Canada. Over the following 38 years, this fund grew nearly 200 times, amassing assets worth $21.3 billion. However, this was just one part of Templeton's extensive fund family. Templeton began his foray into global investments early on, displaying exceptional foresight. In the 1950s, he already recognized the opportunities in the Japanese market and began significant investments in the 1960s. Furthermore, he was among the first American investors to discover the markets in South Korea and China. Forbes magazine praised him as a pioneer in global investment. This investment maestro had a knack for unconventional approaches. For instance, in 1939 when World War II erupted, most people were fleeing the stock market to avoid risks, but Templeton borrowed money to enter the market. Similarly, during the stock market slump of the 1970s, an August 1979 issue of Business Week featured a cover story titled, The Death of Equities. However, at that time, Templeton invested and predicted the impending bull market. In the year 2000, as the Nasdaq index surged, Barron's magazine even mocked Warren Buffett for not understanding tech stocks, suggesting he was falling behind the times. Nevertheless, Templeton went against the tide by shorting the Nasdaq at that very moment, astonishingly profiting each time he went against the consensus. In 1939, the stocks he purchased multiplied fourfold. In 1979, he accurately pinpointed the start of each bull market, and in 2000, his shorting of the Nasdaq became legendary. You might be curious about how Templeton achieved all of this. This book will reveal the answers. The authors of this book are Templeton's great niece and her husband, both of whom were close to Templeton and worked alongside him for many years. In the book, they extensively divulge Templeton's most successful investment cases throughout his life and the secrets to his success. The essence of this book can be divided into three parts. Firstly, how Templeton practiced contrarian investing. Secondly, how he engaged in global investments, and lastly, how he navigated stock market bubbles. These valuable experiences and stories will help you better comprehend the wisdom of this investment maverick. First, let's discuss how Templeton executed contrarian investing. Contrarian investing, as the name suggests, involves doing the opposite of the crowd, buying when others are not, and selling when others are buying. The key to this strategy is buying stocks at the cheapest possible prices. Templeton learned this strategy from his father, Harvey, who was a lawyer and speculator. Harvey's office faced the courthouse in their town. At that time, farm incomes were low and some farm owners would mortgage their farms to borrow money for other businesses. However, if they failed, the mortgaged farms would be auctioned to repay the debt. Typically, these auctions started with a discount relative to market value, attracting numerous buyers. If several buyers were interested in a particular farm, they would bid against each other, and the highest bidder would acquire the farm. During each auction, old Harvey always observed from the second floor and never personally participated in bidding. He was mostly a spectator. However, as soon as a farm received no bids, old Harvey would rush downstairs because in such situations, it required very little money to acquire the farm. 
In Templeton's investment career, he adopted a similar approach he called himself a bargain hunter and spent his entire life scouring the globe for the cheapest stocks. Whether it was buying Japanese stocks in the 1960s, American stocks in the 1980s, or Korean stocks in 2000, Templeton's motivation remained singular cheapness. For example, in 2004, Templeton purchased two Chinese stocks, China Mobile and China Life, ultimately earning a tenfold return. His reason for buying remained the same, they were cheap. The mechanics of the stock market were akin to farm auctions. When many people were eager to buy, you had to pay a high price, and to purchase cheap stocks, you needed to act when no one else was bidding. However, other investors in the market were not fools. Why would they easily let go of cheap stocks? In other words, to find opportunities, we must discover them when most people overlook them. Templeton tells us there are three situations where this can be achieved. Firstly, when stocks encounter issues, the industry's prospects appear bleak, a company experiences slow growth, or it is burdened by poor management or legal troubles, investors tend to shy away. However, some problems are only temporary disturbances and investors overreact to them. At such times, if you have confidence in the company's long-term prospects, it presents an opportunity to buy cheap. For instance, a company might delay the opening of a new factory, causing its stock price to drop by 30% within weeks of the announcement. Although the delay may impact sales growth in the next quarter, the company's fundamentals remain strong and the delay is a temporary issue that will soon be resolved. A 30% drop in the stock price is clearly an overreaction. Templeton likened it to a small cut on your hand that merely needs a band-aid, but some people panic and rush to the intensive care unit. In such situations, rational investors quickly assess the severity of the problem and capitalize on the recklessness of others to find opportunities and buy cheap stocks. The second scenario is when the true value of a stock remains undiscovered by the market. For example, in the 1960s, the stock of a calendar company may appear ordinary. However, Templeton discovered that the company had numerous subsidiary businesses and their earnings were not included in the calendar company's financial statements. When these subsidiary earnings were factored in, the calendar company's earnings would be four times what they were at present. Undoubtedly, this was a cheap stock. Templeton believed that the hidden value of the calendar company would eventually be uncovered by the market and he decisively invested. Subsequently, Japan reformed its financial reporting, incorporating the subsidiary earnings into the calendar company's statements. It was only then that the market realized the hidden value, leading to a substantial increase in the stock price. The third scenario occurs when the market faces unexpected events and plunges into extreme pessimism. These events could be political, such as government negotiations breaking down or economic, like oil embargoes and financial crises. They could also be wartime or terrorist attacks, such as the Gulf War, the 9-11 attacks, and more. These sudden events trigger sharp stock market declines, but such declines typically hit bottom in the short term. For instance, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the stock market fell for 12 days before bottoming out. The Korean War took 13 days, the Gulf War 50 days, and the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks only 5 days. In other words, even though these events were severe in nature, the negative impact was usually short-lived. Therefore, when such unexpected events occur and the market is at its most pessimistic, contrarian buying often allows investors to buy at the lowest prices. Templeton had a famous saying, the most pessimistic moment is the best time to buy. In the early stages of his career, Templeton demonstrated his willingness to take risks. In 1939, the U.S. economy had been stagnant for a decade since the Great Depression and the specter of war in Europe loomed over the market. In this atmosphere of worry and fear, the U.S. stock market plummeted by 49% in just one year, becoming a true stock market disaster. On September 1st of that year, Germany launched a blitzkrieg attack on Poland, officially initiating the war. People widely believed that the global economy would enter a dark period. 
The stock market at that time resembled an auction with no bidders and Templeton, who had been observing from the sidelines, jumped in without hesitation. He purchased stocks at prices below $1, often buying 100 shares of each stock, with little regard for the industry or the company's financials. Most of these stocks he had never even paid attention to before. For years later, despite the ongoing war, Templeton's daring gamble paid off and he gained a threefold return with only four of the 104 stocks he purchased showing losses or going bankrupt. At times when the market is extremely pessimistic, Templeton pinpointed another critical factor, the potential for a reversal in the stock's prospects. For example, in 1939, everyone predicted that the war would cause significant economic damage. However, those who sold stocks in despair overlooked a crucial point. The war would bring a substantial number of orders to American companies. In other words, even though the global economy might decline, American companies had the opportunity to profit from the war. Templeton recognized this turning point. Further analysis revealed why Templeton specifically bought stocks priced below $1. It was because such low-priced stocks typically belong to loss-making companies. However, Templeton studied the history of the American Civil War and World War I and found that during wartime, profitable companies had to pay substantial taxes, whereas loss-making companies did not. He inferred that the U.S. government would adopt a similar policy during this war. Therefore, the actual growth of loss-making companies during the war would be even higher and the extent of their prospects reversing would be greater. Now that we've covered the three situations for finding bargains, the next question is, how do you measure the cheapness of a stock? Templeton used a comparative approach. He identified stocks in the same industry or sector, calculated their financial indicators, and then compared the sizes of these values to determine which stock was cheaper and by how much compared to others. Through this method, Templeton successfully identified those cheap stocks' hiding value and laid a solid foundation for his investment journey. Templeton's three primary metrics for evaluating stock prices will now be discussed in detail. First is the price-to-earnings P-E ratio. The P-E ratio is the ratio of a stock's price to its earnings per share and can be understood as the time it takes to recoup your investment in a particular stock. For example, a P-E ratio of 20 means it would take 20 years to recover your investment. Typically, lower P-E ratios indicate cheaper stocks, but this is not an absolute rule. The P-E ratio has a limitation, it relies solely on past earnings data and doesn't consider future earnings growth. For instance, suppose there are two stocks, the first one maintaining the same earnings this year, while the second one doubles its earnings. Even if both stocks currently have the same P-E ratio, the second stock is considered cheaper. To address this limitation, Templeton introduced the dynamic P-E ratio calculated by dividing the stock price by the expected future earnings per share. He used a five-year earnings forecast based on the historical earnings growth rate of the stock to estimate future average growth and then calculated earnings per share five years later. Finally, he divided the current stock price by the earnings projected for five years in the future to obtain the dynamic P-E ratio. Templeton believed that a dynamic P-E ratio below 5 indicated a cheap stock. Next is the P-E-G ratio. It is the P-E ratio divided by the earnings growth rate. A lower P-E-G ratio suggests a higher likelihood that the stock price is undervalued. For instance, in the 1960s, Templeton examined Ido Yukado, a large Japanese department store with a P-E ratio of 10, while a similar American store, S. S. Kresge, had a P-E ratio of only 8 during the same period. Despite Ido Yukado's higher P-E ratio, Templeton considered it cheaper. Why? Because Ido Yukado had a growth rate of 40%, while S. S. Kresge's growth rate was only 15%. By calculating the PEG ratio, Ido Yukado's PEG value was 10 divided by 40 is equal to 0.25, while S. S. 
Kresge's PEG value was 8 divided by 15 is equal to 0 0.53. Clearly, Ido Yukato had a lower PEG ratio. Lastly, there's the price-to-book ratio PB ratio calculated by dividing the stock price by the book value per share. The book value represents the company's reconstruction cost, so the PB ratio measures the stock price level from the perspective of rebuilding the company. For example, a PB ratio of 5 means that the company's current stock price can rebuild 5 identical companies. A higher PB ratio indicates a higher asset premium and a more expensive stock price, while a lower PB ratio suggests that the company is relatively cheaper. In the late 1970s, the PB ratio of the U.S. stock market dropped to 1, a level as low as it had been during the depths of the Great Depression in 1932. Templeton saw this as an opportunity to invest when stocks were historically very cheap. In hindsight, this marked the beginning of a long bull market in the United States. When comparing PB ratios, it's also important to consider the impact of inflation on asset values. For example, if a company opened five years ago and has a PB ratio of 10, the book value used for calculating the PB ratio is based on data from five years ago. If inflation rates were 10% over the past five years, the actual PB ratio adjusted for inflation would be lower, say, 6. Taking into account inflation rates in the 1930s and 1970s, Templeton found that the real PB ratio in the late 1970s was even lower than it had been in 1932. This further reinforced his belief that stock prices were cheap. Now, we've discussed the three metrics for evaluating stock prices. In addition to these, two other phenomena can help confirm that stock prices are sufficiently cheap. One is mergers and acquisitions, where a company acquires other companies' stock in the stock market. The other is stock buybacks, where a company repurchases its own stock from the stock market. Typically, mergers and acquisitions are initiated by competitors in the same industry while buybacks are initiated by insiders within the company. They have a better understanding of the company than external investors and their willingness to invest real money in the stock is often a signal that the stock is cheap. Templeton emphasized the importance of using multiple indicators and methods when evaluating stock prices. He believed that once a method became widely used, its effectiveness would gradually diminish. For example, Warren Buffett's mentor, Benjamin Graham, proposed a method where a stock was considered cheap if its market value was lower than the value of the inventory in the company's warehouse. While this was indeed an effective way to find cheap stocks, as investors became aware of it, it became harder to find such stocks because they were quickly bought up. Furthermore, using multiple methods is crucial because each method has its own margin of error and employing a variety of methods ensures that you find genuinely cheap stocks. Templeton's essence of global investing remains centered on buying cheap stocks. His reason for looking globally was to expand the scope of his search and find more cheap stocks. For example, in the 1960s, Templeton invested in the Japanese stock market because he saw Japanese stocks as cheap. At that time, Japanese stocks had P-E ratios 80% lower than the U.S. market. However, most American fund managers were biased, viewing Japan as a defeated nation producing cheap everyday consumer goods and low-quality textiles. They held cautious attitudes toward Japan's economy and stocks. In reality, Japan had begun industrial upgrading in the mid-1950s, gradually shifting to produce high-value products like cameras, sewing machines, semiconductors, radios, and machinery. Its economic growth rate reached 2.5 times that of the United States. Dunfton had a deep understanding of this context, so he believed that the currently cheap Japanese stocks would yield substantial returns in the future. Indeed, from 1959 to 1989, the Nikkei-225 index in Japan grew 36-fold. Investors who realized Japan's transformation only in the 1980s started paying attention to Japanese stocks. 
Another example is during the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Many overseas investors were leaving Asian stock markets, but Templeton took the opposite approach and made significant investments in the South Korean stock market. He still saw Korean stocks as cheap. After the financial crisis, Korean stock prices nearly halved and P.E. ratios dropped to below 10, significantly lower than the historical average of 20. Additionally, unlike Thailand and other countries facing debt problems, Korea's issue was more about the short-term maturity of most of its debt. After the International Monetary Fund IMF provided assistance to Korea, Templeton believed that Korea would recover quickly and once again made a contrarian investment. Two years later, his investment had grown by 267%. In the U.S. fund industry, Templeton began global investing relatively early and achieved significant returns. The key to his success was overcoming the challenge of limited information about foreign markets. At that time, few U.S. fund managers paid attention to foreign investments, primarily due to policy restrictions. However, the main obstacle was the lack of understanding of foreign legal policies and research data on foreign companies. Insufficient information could indeed lead to investment mistakes. For example, a foreign company stock might seem cheap, prompting you to buy it, but you might not be aware that the local government has implemented price controls on the company's products, making earnings growth difficult, and thus, the stock not as cheap as it appears. Faced with this situation, Templeton's solution was to actively seek and unearth various information and data. He advocated the ounce of work principle, believing that the difference between successful investors and ordinary individuals lies in their willingness to invest additional time in understanding the situation, conducting in-depth research, such as reading reports, investigating companies, and reading articles, among other efforts. These extra efforts can often be pivotal. For example, in the 1980s, when he was studying the Mexican telephone company, he found the company's financial data to be unreliable. He personally counted the total number of telephones in Mexico and estimated the total telephone expenses to verify the company's data. This required a substantial amount of work and investigation, but once completed, he concluded that the company's stock was indeed very cheap. Of course, if you find all this work too challenging, Templeton recommended a less labor-intensive approach. He said, if you don't have the time or inclination to delve deeply into research in companies, it's better to invest in index funds. Although they may not be as cheap, they are better than many individual stocks. Global investing comes with a unique challenge, exchange rate risk. Investing in foreign stocks involves first exchanging foreign currency, then purchasing stocks, and finally converting the foreign currency back into your home currency when earning returns. If the foreign currency depreciates during your investment period, your returns will correspondingly decrease. To mitigate this risk, Templeton set two conditions for the countries he invested in. First, low debt-to-GDP ratios and high savings rates, and second, significant investments in industry to boost export growth and maintain trade surpluses. Countries meeting these criteria tend to have relatively stable currencies and lower exchange rate risk. Templeton's global investment strategy concludes here. His method still revolves around finding cheap stocks. When purchasing foreign stocks, more information gathering and research are necessary. Alternatively, you can entrust your investments to professional funds. However, it's essential to select countries with relatively stable currencies. Next, we will move on to the third part of this book discussing how to deal with stock market bubbles. Templeton has a famous quote, Bull markets are born on pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. This quote describes the complete cycle of a bull market. When most people are still in a pessimistic mood, the bull market is brewing, making it an excellent time for contrarian investors to buy. When the market goes from pessimism to skepticism, then optimism and euphoria, everyone rushes to buy stocks, and the bull market is about to end. 
At this point, contrarian investors should sell their stocks and exit the market. However, merely exiting the market can protect us from losses, but is there a way to profit? Templeton indeed had two methods. The first is short selling, which involves selling stocks before buying them. When the stock price is at its peak, you sell, and when the price drops, you buy back, making a profit from the difference. Short selling doesn't require you to physically hold the stock, you can borrow the stock to sell, which is also known as shorting. One of Templeton's most classic short selling moves was in the early 2000s when he shorted the Nasdaq technology stocks. In the 1990s, Nasdaq's tech stocks experienced an unprecedented bull market, with some star stocks increasing tenfold or even a hundredfold. By December 1999, Nasdaq's overall P.E. ratio had soared to a record 151 times earnings. The media was full of praise for the new economy and the market was in the peak of the buying frenzy. However, Templeton believed that Nasdaq's bull market was about to end and the market was poised for a major decline, so he decided to short sell. He targeted stocks that had been listed for less than six months and had increased in value more than threefold. Why did he choose such stocks? Because many of the internet tech stocks at that time were not profitable and the only way for founders to make money was to cash out their stocks after going public. Nasdaq's market rules stipulated a six-month lockup period for new stocks, during which founders were not allowed to sell their own shares. Templeton surmised that once this lockup period ended, if the stock prices had risen significantly, founders would quickly cash out. He chose to execute the short sell in early 2000 because nearly $100 billion worth of stock unlocking was set to take place in the first quarter of 2000 and he believed that such a large-scale unlocking could trigger a Nasdaq stock price decline. To summarize, purchasing bonds is a simpler and more secure operation. At this point, the essence of this book has been presented. In brief, the first part introduced the basic principles of contrarian investing, which involve buying cheap stocks. We can use various indicators such as the P-E ratio, the P-G ratio, the P-B ratio, and market phenomena like mergers and buybacks to assess whether stock prices are cheap. The second part covered Templeton's global investment method, emphasizing the need to actively collect information, conduct personal research and analysis or choose indirect investments in foreign stocks through professional funds while being mindful of exchange rate risk. The third part introduced short selling and bond investments as methods to profit even when stock market bubbles burst. Contrarian investors are like hunters tirelessly seeking out cheap stocks in the jungle of capital. To successfully capture prey, the only way is to go against the majority, buying when others are selling in despair and selling when others are buying in excitement. Templeton said that this requires great perseverance but yields the most abundant rewards. Well, Templeton has shown you the method of contrarian investing through this book, teaching you how to navigate the stock market with confidence. At this point, the interpretation of this book concludes. Congratulations on completing another book. Thank you for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom with practice to achieve our financial goals and create a better future. Thank you all, and we'll see you in the next episode.